Today, we're going to be improving the acceleration of this stepside Silverado without having to make any changes or add any horsepower under the hood. And we're going to do that by changing the ratio in the rear differential from 373 to 430 to 1. Now, this will pretty much apply to any rear wheel drive car or truck, or any vehicle for that matter, where you can actually change the ratio in the differential. And by going to a numerically higher gear, you know, 373 to 430, we're going to give the engine a little bit more leverage to help acceleration. Now the trade-off, of course, is we are going to have a little bit higher RPM as we're cruising down the highway, which could, you know, lead to a loss of fuel mileage and things like that. But I'm matching this gear ratio to the power band of the engine. I'm kind of accentuating how the engine makes its power. Now this is a 4.8 liter and it makes a lot of high RPM power. It spins up to like 6,500 and it does not make a lot of low speed torque where by comparison, my other truck, the, um, the ugly truck turbo big block that makes a ton of mid range torque, but it only revs out to like, I mean, I shift that thing at like 5,200. So a gear ratio like a 430 actually would not be a good choice in that truck. In fact, the gears that I am going to be installing in the 10 bolt in the step side used to be in the ugly truck. Now I put the 430s in way back when the ugly truck still had a 5.3 under the hood. Uh, it was a 5.3 and a 4L80 combo. And the 430s actually worked really well with that particular setup. But as soon as I installed the big block and then turbocharged it, I realized that gear is just way too much. So we put the stock 342s back in that truck. Now that's all just to illustrate that every particular engine combination is going to have an ideal gear ratio to do what you want. So 430 is the ratio that we're going to be choosing in this truck. And the other thing you might be thinking to yourself is, well, LT, a 430 is not a great gear for a turbo 4.8. And you would be correct, but I'm not going to tell you why. I'll kind of let you figure that one out as to not spoil the surprise for the parts that we have on the way. But 430 is what we're going to be doing today. Um, also, this is a four wheel drive truck and is going to be converted to all wheel drive, hopefully very soon, which means we need to re-gear both the front and the rear differential. But unfortunately, the eight and a quarter IFS that I have right here, that's my all wheel drive version of the differential. I don't have the gears for that yet. I placed the order about a week, week and a half ago, and I called them up beforehand and I said, hey, I just, you know, I checked stock and they said they had like 30 some sets of gears, but unfortunately they haven't shipped out yet. So I called them up this morning and I'm waiting to hear back. So I won't be able to actually complete the complete gear change, you know, both front and back today, but at least I'll be able to get the rear set done. I'll make the changes in the computer and we can at least drive the truck and, you know, take a comparison in the zero to 60 times from the three 73s to the new 430s. Uh, in addition to re-gearing, we're also going to be installing a Detroit True Track. This is a limited slip differential, but instead of like clutches, it uses a helical gear setup, which I use these in everything. I love them. They never let me down pretty much. You know, if you're going off-road, it's not a great differential, like a locker might be better, but for anything like performance or street oriented, I always run a true track. So we're gonna be putting one of those in. And of course I have a master install kit. It's kind of basic stuff, you know, bearings, bolts, seals and shims and gear marking compound, basically everything that we need to get the carrier swapped out and set the backlash and the pinion depth. We'll get all that squared away. Um, this will, I've done a bunch of gearing stuff and I've made some really in-depth videos before. Um, and I will be cheating a little bit on this one because I've already had these gears set up. I kind of know approximately what pinion depth shim I'm going to need for them to run properly. Um, so this hopefully should be a really easy conversion. Um, and then we'll get it on the road and we'll do some zero to 60 comparisons. But first we got to get this thing torn down.
So we have the teardown complete and I have all the small parts that we're going to be reusing. Uh, they're all cleaned up in the parts washer and they're ready to go back together. I still do need to clean out the actual axle housing itself and press the new bearing races into the axle. But other than that, we're ready to move on to the tricky part, which is setting the pinion depth. Uh, now, pinion depth is basically the distance or how far away the pinion gear is from the center line of the ring gear. You can kind of picture it like that, which is, of course, exaggerated, but that's what we're trying to set. And it's controlled by a thin shim that sits, or on a 10 bolt anyway, it's controlled by that little uh, shim that sits in between the big pinion bearing and the pinion gear itself. Now I did tell you that I was gonna cheat because I have had this gear set installed in another 8.610 volt that just happened to be in my other 2000 Chevy Silverado. So we have the same year truck, same year axle, and my hunch is that the same shim will actually work between the two of those. And here's my reasoning. Um, when I put the 430s in the ugly truck, it turned out that the 34 thousandths thick factory shim was the best shim for the pattern on this set of 430s. So when I pulled the 373s out of the step side, I pulled the bearing off the pinion. And when you know it, it actually shared the same exact thickness, 34 thousandths of an inch for the pinion shim. So I think that's gonna be the one that we will run. But to check it, basically what we'll do is we'll put the shim on there kind of like that. I'll put my setup bearing on just kind of temporarily because that'll allow me to make changes if that's not the right shim. Um, we'll run a gear pattern. I also, by the way, made a setup bearing for the outside so that'll easily slide on and off. Um, so we'll put it together. I'll get the backlash pretty close and then we will run a pattern check. And that's kind of, the main way that you verify that your gears are installed correctly in terms of pinion depth is by looking at the pattern or where the two gears contact each other. Uh, the master install kit will come with this little, it's like a yellow waxy paste or paint or grease almost. Anyway, you put it on the gears and you spin them back and forth and then you look at where the gears rub the paint off. This is called you know running a pattern check. And the book that comes with the install kit it shows you all the acceptable and the unacceptable patterns. For example, if the pinion depth or the pinion is too close to the center of the ring gear, this is what it'll look like, or these are all the acceptable patterns. Um, so I'm not gonna get too much in depth with this part. <laughs> in depth, get it? Badoomch. Anyway, um, I'm not gonna get too in depth on the pattern check because I think it's gonna be very easy to set up. And I do have another video I made about a year and a half ago explaining in detail how to set up the pinion depth. But once we get that squared away, I, and I have the final bearing, I will remove, uh, sorry, in, my, in the final thickness, I'll remove the setup bearings and press on the final bearing. And then basically the rest of the install from there is super simple because we'll just set the backlash. That's very simple to adjust with the different shims on the side of the carrier. And then we'll stab the axles back in and we're pretty much on our way.
So I've had this gear set in and out of the axle about a dozen different times. And then it kind of made me think back to when I did this the first time in the other 8610 bolt is I kind of had the same problem where I just, I tried many, many different thicknesses of pinion depth shim just to try to chase the pattern down and get it exactly where I wanted it to be. And when I set up the old axle, I think I originally uh, figured a 40 thousandths shim was correct and then I drove it and made a little bit of noise. And then I think I tore it back apart and I put the 34 or the 35, whatever the factory shim was, I put that one in and that seemed to make it just a little bit quieter. Although the pattern to me looked better at 40 thousandths of an inch. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've, the pattern that I'm like the happiest with, with this axle is like 37 thousandths. Um, so that's kind of right in between my other two numbers. So I'm in the ballpark at least. And I'm just not entirely sure that when we get this thing together, if it's gonna be quiet or not. Now, I do know that most of the time, if you have gear noise, it's usually an installer error. So I'm not gonna say that I had it in exactly where it needed to be, but, I also do know that sometimes they say certain aftermarket gear sets will cause a little bit of noise. So um, probably it wasn't installed correctly. I'll kind of put that out there, but there's a chance it's just the gears, they do make a little bit of noise. So the pattern that I'm closest to right now is this guy right here. Like on the coast side, it's very near the top edge of the gear and it's kind of long and oval like that. But on the drive side, Mine is centered pretty well, but instead of a short oval like this, it's kind of long where I made that dotted line. So almost like a combination of these two here. But if you turn the page to the pinion too far away, we're like borderline this one here, although the bottom edge of the coside is much more straight across than this one is. Um, so I think that this is kind of where we're at. This is definitely the closest depiction out of all of these. Um, so I think at 37 thousandths of an inch, we're gonna try to send it. Hopefully it's not too noisy. Um, now, the other thing that I, I went back and I watched my old video, and I think at the time I set the backlash at 10 thousandths of an inch, which the range for this rear end, the 8.6 10 bolt, is between six and 10 thousandths of an inch. Now, I will say on the ring and pinion gear, there is scribed the number 0.006 or six thousandths. So, what I'm assuming is they intend that to be the backlash of the gear. So I'm going to try to set this one on the tighter side, six thousandths. So maybe that'll eliminate some of the noise because I do know backlash being too, uh, too tight or too wide can cause noise. Pretty much if you have the gear set up wrong, any which way, too tight, too loose, they're going to make noise. So um, we're going to try to get them to the tight side of spec, but still within spec. And hopefully they'll run nice and quiet.
All right, so as you can see, the truck is on the ground. We have the rear end all put together, and I actually just got back from a little 15-mile break-in drive. And so far, so good. We'll talk about that in just a second, and I will take you guys for a spin here in a minute. But first, I wanted to address a few questions that I've gotten in my messages and things like that, because as I post these daily updates and you guys see what I'm doing, a lot of you will message me and you know ask me questions, and I'm happy to answer them. But a few of these questions I have got on more than one occasion, so I figured it'd be worthwhile just to kind of go over a lot of the steps that I probably kind of glossed over as we were doing the install. Uh, and the first one has to do with tightening the pinion nut on a rear end like this. Um, once you have your gear pattern dialed in, once you've selected the right shim, the very first step is installing the pinion back into the housing with a final bearing and set the pinion bearing preload. Um, pinion bearing preload basically is sort of how close or far apart these two bearings are from one another. So obviously as they get closer to each other, it'll be harder to turn this pinion. Um, the distance is controlled by this guy right here. That's called a crush collar. And as you tighten the nut, of course, there'll be a yoke in between this bearing and the nut. The bearing race pushes down on here and it squishes that guy and it makes it a little bit harder to turn. Now, there is no specific torque reading for this nut right here. It is going to be very tight, probably like well over 200 foot pounds of torque, but uh, forget the torque reading because that's not what you want. You basically tighten this nut until you reach in this particular case, uh, I believe 14 to 19 inch pounds of rotation. So how much force it takes to turn that in the housing with no carrier, no axles, nothing else, just the pinion. Um, if you go too tight, you will have to take it apart and reset. Um, you will need to put a new crush collar in. I do keep a box on hand for these 10 bolts just because I've done enough of them and I have messed up before. This is from O'Reilly's, that's the part number, and they're like a dollar each. So I got a box on hand just in case. But um, if you do have a master install kit, it'll come with one. Uh, when I tightened the pinion nut, you probably noticed I did use the impact gun, which will work. It is a bit of a shortcut, and it's also a little bit dangerous um, in the sense that you can easily overshoot your target. Uh, it does take, like I said, quite a bit of force to get that pinion nut tight to compress the crush collar enough and it will take quite a few turns at first so i basically i'll zap it with the impact gun i'll check it you know if you can wiggle it in and out a little bit clearly it needs to go further so i'll kind of zap it a couple times i'll check it i'll zap it i'll check it but once you get close to once you have all the slack taken up it is very easy to overshoot it because a very small turn of the nut will make a pretty big impact on the drag of the bearing so Basically, if you go too far, take it back apart and put a new crush collar in. They're inexpensive, and if you don't, could lead to problems down the road. So anyway, uh, that's basically setting the pinion bearing preload in a nutshell. Forget the torque on the nut, just tighten that guy until you have the right amount of drag with only the pinion in the housing. Uh, next up, we have backlash, which is just kind of shifting the carrier left and right until you get your desired backlash. On this particular setup, the spec they call for is between six and ten thousandths of an inch. I wound up at 7.5 thousandths of an inch, and that's because uh, I wanted to go at six thousandths, but because my minimum shim thickness I have to play with is three thousandths of an inch, that's as close as I could get it. But that's well within the specification, so we're good to go there. Uh, if you do have like a 14 bolt or a Dana 60, a Dana 70, you know, a bigger axle with threaded side adjusters, you can dial backlash in exactly where you want it. Um, and then you have to worry about uh, carrier bearing preload, which is sort of similar to pinion bearing preload, but you don't really have a good way to measure it. But basically what I do is I just kind of judge by how easy or difficult it is to get the carrier into the axle housing. Um, if it just kind of slides right in with no force required, it's probably too loose. But conversely, if you have to bash the thing in with a hammer, it's probably a little bit too tight and you need to lose a little bit of thickness of shim. Um, the shim kit is part of a master install kit. This one has, I believe it has 3,000, 6,000, has some 10s, 20s, and of course it has like these kind of base shims which you stack together. And there's a, a top one of these somewhere, but basically there's a top and a bottom that make uh, 220,000, and then you add up the difference with, you know, say that's like a 10 right there. Uh, you stack that in the middle and then you put the top one on there. Um, and of course the kit also has an assortment of pinion bearing shims as well. So you can set this rear end pretty much exactly where you want it. So the first
first thing that I noticed just kind of driving through easy traffic like this is it definitely takes a lot less throttle to get the truck up and moving because we've given the engine effectively a lot more leverage to do the same amount of work it was doing before. Now, obviously the trade-off is a higher RPM at cruising speed, but right now uh, we're going 45 miles an hour. I'm in third gear and it's like just over 2000 RPM. And then if I shift up to fourth, uh, maybe we can get up to a little bit quicker here. Uh, fourth gear at 50 miles an hour is like 1600 RPM. So definitely not ridiculous. Um, the tires on here, they're 265, 75, 16. So they're a little bit taller. They're like 31 and a half inches tall, I think. Uh, and we have the 4L60, which has a pretty good overdrive gear ratio. I am gonna be swapping to a 4L80 eventually with a little bit shorter tire, which is gonna raise my RPMs. Um, but I think when I had this set up, in the other truck with a 4L80 at like 75, it was doing like, it was either 75 or 80 miles an hour, it was 3,000 RPM. So it's not ridiculous, but it is a little bit on the high side. Although for a small motor like this, I feel like it's gonna be just perfect. Um, I have tuned the truck to compensate for the different gear ratio. So the speedometer is now correct and it has sh uh, corrected my shift points and things like that. And so far from what I've noticed, that's kind of spot on. So no complaints there. Once we do get to the wide open throttle portion of things, I will have to kind of double check the shift points. But uh, so far, the main thing that I'm really happy with and pleased about is these gears don't make any noise. Um, they did make a little bit of noise when I had them, had them in my last truck, but evidently, whether it was the backlash or the pinion depth, um, they're, from what I can tell, spot on. So I'm really, really happy with that. Um, the two ways I judge success on a re-gear job uh, is the amount of noise they make, which hopefully should be none, and how warm they get. Now, a numerically higher gear is gonna get a little bit warmer than a numerically lower gear, but after my 15 minute drive, or sorry, 15 mile drive last night, uh, I put the laser thermometer on there and it was like 120 degrees, so I was like really, really happy because I have done them before where they'll make a lot of noise, like a whining, a whining sound when you're on and off the throttle at a very specific speed. Um, and I have had gear sets that get a little bit warmer. Like um, I did a Mustang years ago when this was my own car and it got up to like 170 degrees after like a 15 or 20 mile drive. And I didn't love that, but this one, I think we're like perfect, we're spot on. So I'm really happy with the install. Now, I don't think I am gonna get to a wide open throttle pull to do like a zero to 60 comparison in this video. Just to be safe, I think I wanna put like 100, 150 miles on these gears before we do any sort of acceleration testing. Uh, but in a future video, hopefully very shortly, I will do a zero to 60 on this. I have the times to compare to before. And also, now that I have the Caltrax and the good converter in the ugly truck, we're also gonna do some testing on that. So I think the same video will do zero to 60 and eighth mile on both trucks just to kind of do a comparison. Um, that will bring this video to an end. Uh, I guess I thank you guys for watching. It is appreciated. Do me a favor though, like, comment, and subscribe. Um, and I'll catch you next time, guys. Thank you for watching.